In American politics, there's an idea that the president basically determines the price of gas. That whatever you're paying at the pump, it's always their fault. Drivers are paying a heavy price for the Bush administration's failure to enact a comprehensive energy strategy. The gas pump is 100% on Biden's desk. It's 100% his fault. But that's not very accurate. At the very simplest level, the price of oil is pretty much a reflection of supply and demand. The more oil there is on the market, the less that oil is going to be worth. But think about who controls the energy market. Groups like the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, decide how much oil is going to be pumped in order to basically set global prices. And energy companies decide, with influence from their shareholders, how much oil they're going to be producing. But unlike the consumers, who of course want low prices, the suppliers have an incentive to keep prices high, even in times of crisis. Those gas prices are inching up. Yeah, the price of crude oil has jumped, and that could cause gas prices to rise even more. They're now spiking because of worries about global oil supplies. The price of oil and gas going up has an inflationary impact unlike anything else. So oil companies could expand domestic production to face the crisis, but they've been very hesitant to do that. Instead of ramping up production elsewhere in the world, investors and owners of these oil companies are uh, engaging in capital discipline, uh, according to the CEOs of these companies, and telling them that we don't want you to go out and drill more oil because we don't think that that's going to be profitable for us in the long term. For the last 10 years or so, the financial community has uh, given lots of money to these oil companies to engage in exploration, especially in fracking, and those investments turned out actually not to be profitable, and they basically just don't want to do that again. This is Matt Brunig of the People's Policy Project. He's a policy analyst with a particular focus on economics, and he's pointing out something that happened a few years ago. In the 2010s, investors lost money because oil supply was too high and prices too low. Due to massive expansion of drilling, American shale alone lost $300 billion, while motorists enjoyed what amounted to a huge gas subsidy. So those investors learned. They now encourage oil companies not to produce in order to inflate profits. In the words of one financial analyst, quote, it's not the government that is banning them from drilling more, it's pressure from their shareholders. That's why a survey of oil and gas executives found that the overwhelming reason for low production was not government action, but quote, investor pressure to maintain capital discipline. So that's the truth about why energy prices are so high. It's a system of upwards redistribution. And the only way to stop it is to stop being so dependent on oil and gas. Just look at a country like France. In France, nuclear power is the leading source of energy, housing is much denser, and public transportation is decent. So the French have been relatively cushioned from the effects of oil price shocks, simply because they are not so dependent on oil. Of course, switching your society's built environment away from oil requires a lot of time. So you need to think seriously about how to put the oil industry into a sort of managed decline, while also controlling prices for ordinary car driving consumers, who often have no other choice but to drive. Uh, we can't have it go on forever because obviously that would wreck the climate. We also can't end it immediately because we don't have enough clean energy to replace it. So. The oil industry needs to be put on a managed decline. But private investors are not in the business of temporarily propping up industries they think are dying in the face of huge efforts to phase out fossil fuel extraction. The commitment to largely end the use of fossil fuels. We are on course for devastating changes to our climate. No more drilling, no ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period. So if private actors are unable to manage this transition, public ownership might be necessary. By bringing the public ownership, you can kind of manage both ends of it. You can make sure that production continues when we need it, and you can make sure that it goes away when we, when we want it to go away. 
Norway is an example that I use frequently. They're a state-owned oil company, which is now called Equinor, and it's been running very well there. They were mostly concerned with capturing the profits of the industry and making sure that those profits uh, you know, serve the social good. Now, Norway is not perfect. In many ways, Norway is very hypocritical about climate, in large part because it is unwilling to actually end its oil exploration activities. But if you're interested in controlling gas prices while also having the power to transition away from fossil fuel dependence, public actors are still much better positioned to do that than private ones. It would mean managing oil and gas extraction not through private actors motivated by profit, but public actors, using that money not for stock buybacks and executive compensation, but investment in green energy, dense housing, and public transportation. A better way is very possible. 